Well, good day, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is the Psychedelic Support Speaker Series. I'm your host, Dr. Allison Fiducia. And if you're new here, we do this roughly once a month, and we like to bring in different speakers to focus on topics that are important for the psychedelic medicine field. And we like to make these conversations accessible to everyone, but we're definitely going to be doing a pretty deep dive today into a novel psychotherapeutic model for administering psychedelic medicines. Um, if you're interested in getting CE credits, I will drop a link in. So we put all of these webinars available for continuing education for psychologists, therapists, and the likes. And as we go to, I'll be dropping in um, some extra links for you to get more information about the Embark model, which we'll be hearing about today. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker. We'll go for um, an hour. If there's time at the end, we'll, we'll take your question. So if something comes up while you're listening to the talk, you can put it into the QA session section at the bottom of your dashboard in the Zoom window. That's the best place to put the questions. And uh, as I mentioned, we'd love to hear where you're calling in from. If you wanna drop your name in the chat, uh, you're welcome to have some discussions there as we're listening to the presentation. And we do make the video available after. Um, you can find it on um, this page along with our other videos from our speakers. And we'll also send out uh, a follow-up email with the links to find out more and to watch the video again if you like. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce our speaker today. Alex Belser is a clinical sci scientist, author, and licensed psychologist with a focus on psychedelic research. Currently, he is at Yale University working as a co-investigator on a psilocybin study for OCD. And prior to this, he has worked on several clinical trials investigating psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, DMT, um, for a number of different indications, uh, all focused on alleviating mental health symptoms such as depression, anxiety, addiction, and PTSD. And so from all this work, he and other colleagues developed uh, the Embark model, which we're gonna hear an uh, overview today about this novel therapeutic framework for administering psychedelic medicines. If you wanna go deeper into understanding this model, there is 15 hours of free open, ac open access videos to learn about the model. And I'll drop the link in just a second. And there's also going to be a new book coming out, which Alex has co-authored entitled Embark Psychedelic Therapy for Depression, A New Approach for the Whole Person. So this is really exciting work to see uh, the development of new and expansion of some of the models that have been tested in the clinical trials. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Alex, so we can uh, jump right into this discussion. It's really sweet to be here, Ali, and to be with everybody. I see a lot of familiar names. Um, I'd also like to give a, 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 a recognition to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Brennan, who's who's in the room, who is the co-author of and co-creator of Embark, um, and, and also of the forthcoming book. Uh, so uh, he, he could be giving this talk better than I could, but I uh, am happy to be with you all here today. Uh, I I'm passionate about psychotherapy. I I I I love um, working with people clinically. I mean, sometimes it's extremely difficult, and I imagine there are many clinicians here in the room. Um, but I love working with psychedelic medicine and doing the preparatory work and the medicine work and the integration work. And I'm also endlessly as many of you may be fascinated by how to do this, how to teach this, how to train to do this. Um, what do we, what do we learn from what has happened before and how do we adapt it and build from where we are today, given what we know. And so in part that has been motivating me in clinical trials at NYU and at Yale and at Cybin and um, around the world to try to understand what it is that is happening and how we can use these medicines in good ways um, and how we can move beyond the, the sort of infancy of the psychedelic resurgence through early adolescence or whatever stage we're in into a greater degree of skillful 
uh, maturity, both ethically and, and clinically? Uh, and how do we learn from one another? And Embark, in part, is, is in this spirit. Uh, so I'm going to share some slides uh, and try to provide a rationale. Um, and uh, my share screen function is here. Um, you know, one of we we didn't do this alone. Dennis McKenna is one of our advisors, uh, and really teaching us about using and working with DMT in particular. But uh, he he says if psychedelics are ever to be integrated into modern clinical medicine, you know these therapy protocols are as important as the medicines themselves, which I think is oftentimes over overlooked. Uh, the Embark program, which is something we developed in, in our clinical trials, incorporates a multidimensional approach to these therapies to enable them to be tailored to a variety of patient needs. Um, so we thank Dennis for his adv advisement and many other advisors. I'll, I'll be sharing the full team later. I do want to disclose all of my potential biases. I, I teach in, in eight different psychedelic therapy training programs and receive some income from uh, places like IPI and psychedelic support and uh, synthesis and Atma, Chakruna, Psychedelics Today, Vital as a speaker or as a trainer. Uh, and more recently, and Embark in part is funded as an open access program through funding from Cybin. Uh, I've also been a therapist on the MDMA trial that MAPS um, has recently concluded uh, their phase to be uh, into multi-site phase trials. Uh, and as Ali mentioned, I'm uh, working on an OCD trial under the leadership of Dr. Ben Kelmendi and Chris Pittenger and others at, at, at Yale. This is a review for, probably for everybody in the room, but we are in a place where <laughs> it's like been drinking from a, high, a fire hose these last five years, just a geometric expansion in the number of registered clinical trials, the number of publication counts, and this graph is even uh, in terms of psychedelic publications already out of date, it's three years old. Uh, this is in nature. The number of clinical trials is now, I think, over 150 registered clinical trials around the world, with mainly with psilocybin and derivatives, but also MDMA. And, and, and not for no reason. The reason is that uh, what we see is extremely strong this is from our my my team's research at NYU. Um, this is older research now treating people with cancer with psilocybin uh, who had depression and distress and anxiety. And we just see really strong on the back depression inventory, very strong remission rates over 80%, uh, which is unusual. If you're a clinical trial methodologist and you see remission rates this high, uh, you start to scratch your head and you see a nice discrimination between the people who received the therapy plus psilocybin versus people who received the therapy plus a, a placebo, an active placebo. And the effect size is there at the top, Cohen's D, is just an indication that um, any Cohen's D equals one is a, is a very large magnitude effect size, meaning that there's a full standard deviation shift in the sample that you, of people that you're working with uh, that they, they have a full standard deviation benefit in terms of their depression symptomatology. That's important because conventional depression <laughs> treatments have a Cohen's D shift of, if you include all the trials that are submitted to the agencies, on average about 0.25, uh, sometimes 0.3. Occasionally you'll get one around 0.4 or higher, but uh, you're looking at relatively low effect sizes versus some of these early psychedelic trials, at least. And here's, you know, our colleague, Robin Carhart Harris's, we just see very strong depression remission. So this is all very exciting. And the clinical world is um, pumped, <laughs> delighted, um, even a little scared to see how much change there is, because we don't really understand exactly what is going on what are the mechanisms of actions at a neurobiological level, at a psychological clinical level, at a psycho-spiritual mystical level that may account for these very, very strong effect sizes. And here's, uh, you know, the, the sort of infamous Escitalopram versus psilocybin trial. 
Escitalopram, Lexapro is, you know, the leading first line treatment for depression and, and psilocybin, there's a little bit of, about, of debate about whether or not psilocybin outperforms escitalopram in the study. Uh, but but it's clear that the trend is that psilocybin uh, treatment, and it's not just psilocybin, it's psilocybin plus a, a psychosocial intervention um, seems to outperform um, the leading treatment for depression, which has been um, around for a long time. So what I'd like to do is, th this is all fine and good, but I really, when thinking about the question of as clinicians, as therapists, as people providing psychological support, I want to ground our work emically in the actual experience of the patients, of the participants in these trials, rather than etically from the top down and just say, okay, we're going to borrow a CBT intervention and just drop it into psilocybin or DMT or 5-MeO DMT intervention. What if we built the psychotherapy, the, the, the therapeutic intervention from the ground up, given the phenomena, the various complex phenomena that seem to arise when people take a good dose of psychedelic medicine. So I, I my specialization has been in in-depth interviews, and I interviewed uh, here, I'll pull out one quotation from each of 13 people that I interviewed in our trial, uh, cancer trial with psilocybin at NYU. And so these are the patient voices. I'd like to give some space to their voice and their experience. This participant said, I felt completely at peace and whole and loved. I felt so loved and understood and forgiving. 12. I can go into myself and find peace and comfort. It's there. So I am changed by this and in pretty significant ways. 11. I felt connected to myself. I felt more self-love and a feeling of love for humanity very deeply. It's the first time I ever really felt like I was part of the world instead of separate from it. 10. This woman was really amazing. She said, it's there. I mean, it's there. Looking into a flower, it's there. Watching a praying mantis move its tentacles, it's there. That the one is any time and all the time. It's all the time. It's always there. It's like, it almost made me feel stupid. Like, hello, wake up. It's like waking up in the most profound way that this is really what life is. It's really like this. We are just not noticing. Nine, bathed in universal love. It was such a strong feeling. The eighth participant said, from when I was 17 until I did the study, when I was 24, my spiritual life was like dormant. I was going to say dead, but just like dormant, it was non-existent. And this not only stirred that back up, it reassured me beyond doubt that there is a spiritual realm and I need to be aware of it. It's an important part of my existence. Seven. I have a restored ease with life. The percentage of my life that I'm able to be present in just a moment has increased dramatically. Six, this vision was very part of a much broader, longer vision. She said, I kind of felt, she saw, I, I, I kind of felt like that was my umbilical cord to the universe. And that this is where my life would be drained from me someday and I would surrender it willingly when my time came. And that was just so profound. And then also that, and then I started hearing, I choose, I chose this, I chose this, knowing how it would end. I was soaring in a cathedral. It was amazing, but I spent a lot of time floating around up in those spires and with certain music. And that was really incredible for me because I think that that became apparent to me. But as much as it was wonderful, sort of uplifting and spiritual and godlike, I really wanted to be flat on the ground, you know? 
I'm there with God, but I want to be almost in the trenches. I want to be the doing person, not a complete spiritual in the clouds person. I'll let you read this fourth participant's quotation. This young man said to me, how do you explain infinity? What do I tell you? What word do you want me to use to explain infinity? Because that is what I am feeling. I am experiencing infinity. Two, you just see with your own eyes that that's what happens after you lose your body. And there is nothing to be afraid of. And the, the first and the last participant said, my heart was an energetic field that I was able to work with. There was no sense of theoretical mental gymnastics. It was all in the realm of the heart. And that's where the whole thing took place. I, I, when I was doing these interviews, over half the people, and I was interviewing them weeks to months after their, their single psilocybin experience and therapy, intensive therapy, and they, you know, more than half of them teared up or cried just recalling what had happened for them. And I, when we think about building, cultivating a psychotherapy or an interpersonal intervention around these experiences, it seemed that a lot of the sort of evidence-based treatments, EBTs that I learned about didn't quite, you know, it's like the wrong, it didn't quite fit. It didn't seem like it would be a one size fits all. It's just borrow from the existing practice and, and plunk it down here. So with psilocybin, I, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Bill Brennan, who's, who's here, Dr. and also Dr. Alex Kelman. Um, we've done, we've put out two recent reviews. We did a systematic review of all of the different published interventions around psychological support with psychedelic medicine, therapy, psychedelic assisted therapy, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And I'll just give you the quick takeaway. You know, we did a, a, a systematic review of all of these different trials that have published on this. And what we found was a little disappointing. Um, what we found was that there was systematic underreporting. Everybody focused on the dosage of the medicine and how the medicine was given and all the safety data, of course. But there was short shrift given to actually what happened in the human interaction, the psychosocial intervention. And so in our meta-analyses of 33 published trials, we found that many of our colleagues, who, whom I have tremendous respect for, but many of them did not report basic aspects of what they did, including 33% did not report the number of sessions. 45% in these, on these articles did not report the duration of the sessions. 42% did not report the credentials of the people that were providing the therapy. Over half, 52%, did not report if the intervention used a manual, a therapy manual. Over two thirds did not reference a manual that was actually available to the public so that we could understand what was what they were, was actually, were actually doing. And then in terms of therapy adherence, which is really important if you're talking about fidelity measures and psych psychological research, 82% did not report that they assessed treatment fidelity. So, that's not great. I mean, I think that it's probably my take on this is it's a sign of a somewhat immature field. It's a sign of a lot of people with focusing on psychiatry and regulatory issues regarding medication, but actually having not a lot of experience with psychological research or psychotherapy development and manualization and training and how to report actually what's happening meaningfully in the psychotherapy interactions or, 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 or the psychological support interactions, if that's the model they're using. In the second article, we put this is this is already published. It's a models of psychedelic therapy, we where we introduce Embark, which is our transdiagnostic transdrug model. But we first look at all the different existing models, again in a, in a slightly different way, and we 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 we've kind of moved on from this, but I think it's still a helpful way of thinking about them. We kind of class them in the two basic models. The, the first is models that do psycho that do therapy with kind of like a basic support approach, which is sort of like some sort of psychological psychedelic support. 
And the second group at the bottom are what we call EBT inclusive models, where you do a kind of set and setting thing, but you also add in or integrate meaningfully an evidence-based therapy that pre-exists. So for example, CBT or ACT or um, brief cognitive expressive group therapy or ACE or perceptual control theory or uh, some sort of existential therapy, et cetera. Now, what we there's a lot of richness here and i and i want to be very um this is my loving critique i i i mean i trained with many of these authors i trained with uh, the myth authors and with bill richards and company at hopkins and with jeff gus at nyu and and many of these folks are actually on our team uh, on you know, helped us develop embark but he, here's my takeaway um that that bill brennan and i have come up with with the limitations and in, in when we canvassed the existing therapy models. What we saw was that even though patients in these trials had very strong somatic experiences, they oftentimes were shaking, they had, they were, had visions in their body, they had um, a, a somatic processing, tr the body keeps the score, psychedelics and the body seemed to have, have be deeply related. The psychotherapies had a lack of attentiveness to the body. It was kind of ignored. And many of the trainings didn't even have like basic somatic competency interventions. Why, why ignore the body? We also saw a lack of focus in many of these existing psychedelic therapies on the actual interaction, you know, what we might call transference, countertransference, but the therapist participant relationship, which consistently came up time and time again, and there's been many articles on this, that people, when they are taking medicine, the relationship with the therapist or two therapists is extremely important. And their human relational social world, their social garden, people see their mother and father, sister, brother, their girlfriend from college, you know, beloved ancestors, their, their human interactions uh, and relational attachments are so important. And yet many of the existing psychotherapies didn't attend to those meaningfully. We also found a lack, even though it's almost canonical to say that psychedelics are spiritual and that even the data on the MEQ and the mystical experience suggests that it is a mediator of benefit for alcohol use disorder, for smoking cessation, for depression and anxiety, even though the mystical experience is canonically important, the actual psychotherapies didn't actually include spiritual counseling. They didn't actually um, have something meaningfully there, that sort of framework or rubric necessarily in many of these for understanding religious experience, spiritual, mystical, profound existential experiences that uh, were very common in, in psilocybin journeys, which was puzzling to me. Obviously, the field has been rocked by an insufficient focus on ethics, not just sexual transgressions and ethics around touch, but all sorts of ethical problems around dropping patients after the treatment, ethical issues regarding um, getting placebo, ethical issues of like whether or not you admit people into the trial or not. And, and so a lot of these psychotherapies said, well, this is the psychotherapy. You have to refer to your board for your ethical principles. Like if you're a psychologist, go to the APA code of ethics, but the psychotherapy doesn't actually, the therapeutic intervention doesn't really have like an ethical module. There's not really necessarily an, an ethical cornerstone or training, which seems strange to me to export that to professional practice guidelines and not to center it in the therapy because of the high, potentially heightened risk of ethical harm in psychedelic work. What is the role? I mean, for the people in this room, like, what is your role? It's like the basic question that like Rogers asked, like, what is the role of the therapist? And, and, and many of the, these had a very limited conception. It was oftentimes, especially with sort of canonical psychedelic, it's like, there's this idea that what is your role? Stand back and let the medicine do the work or let the patient do the work with the medicine. But I have to say, since you're doing hours of prep and you're with the person for eight hours in the room during medicine session, and then you're with them for many hours in integration, the idea that the therapist is just standing back and letting the person do the work seemed a, a little sim simplistic and even potentially um, 
uh, sort of theoretically biased against like you're just like a blank container for a process to happen. When we know that interpersonally the role of the therapist is, is being played out in some important way, we should attend to and conceptualize that meaningfully. Okay, what about, you know, a lot of these people in these trials, they've been practicing therapy for decades. They have tens of thousands of hours of experience. They've done mindfulness trainings. They have, you know, the relational psychoanalysts. Um, they have profound somatic or, you know, em em embodied sort of practices. And then they show up and do it. They do an 80 hour training, like a little tiny training. And suddenly they're expected to do like that thing. But how do you, in a psychotherapy that does psychedelic work, how do you guide how the therapist, how do you make use of the therapist's existing skills and not just pretend like they don't come into the room with tens of thousands of hours of experience, right? Like we want to actually allow them to be skillful in doing what they, they already do. Okay, the, the, and we're rounding the bend here, but like what about change mechanisms? Like there's been a lot of attention theoretically in a science-based medical model about neurobiological mechanisms of change. We have the rebus model and the default mode network and functional neuroconnectivity and the anti-inflammation hypothesis and um, neuroplasticity and a critical learning window and uh, BDNF and all of these things could be complementary and true and simultaneously true. But they're all operating uh, in a way that I believe has actually extremely limited explanatory power on an individual participant by participant basis. You know, it's like one thing to tell a participant, you have a critical learning window that opens up and now you can stop ruminating and start you know, practicing self-compassion this week. Let's do it. That's fine and good, but, but clinically, what I realized is that we had a limited conception of change mechanisms and specifically psychological change mechanisms. And it seems like there's not a lot of money or scientific funding research priority to look at psychological change mechanisms. We're very interested in the brain, but not necessarily the mind. But in, th in therapy, in psychosocial interventions, it's, it's those change mechanisms, not just therapeutic alliance, but all the different ways that people can change. Human beings can change meaning and identity and their body and what, what interpretation they give to their vision and how it changed their lives. That's where the real potato, meat and potatoes are of psychotherapeutic change processes. So we should talk about that in the therapy. And lastly, uh, there were some challenges that we saw with incorporating non psychedelic EBTs. So it's even been argued in a recent article that we should just like forget all the other psychedelic therapies and just like CBT is the, the thing to do. We should do cognitive behavioral therapy. It's like shown to be efficacious. Let's do CBT plus some sort of, you know, psychological support model. And I, I think that there are certain limitations to EBTs. Um, that uh, reduce the autonomy of the clinician and the participant, um, that, that they are exported um, from a separate discipline into a psychedelic phenomena, that they um, in some ways hamstring what can happen and how we can make sense of what's happening in an extremely heterogeneous set of change processes for dozens, hundreds of participants. Uh, who, who, who get better, but they get better for different reasons, not necessarily the prescribed mechanism um, given by the evidence-based therapy. And lastly, a lot of these uh, EBTs are hamstringing the therapists who come in with a thousand hours of mindfulness practice, but then they're supposed to operate in a different way. So we want to be able to take advantage of, of their skill. Um, plus, there's no actual evidence in a head-to-head -head trial that one particular evidence-based therapy like CBT is better than anything else. There's like zero evidence of that. So here's a, here's a short rough list of, of some of the influences for Embark. Um, and, and, and we, we hoped and we spoke with, and we did many trainings with, I said, we, uh, Bill Brennan and myself, uh, looking toward how to distill and learn from the best of what's already been happening um, and integrate that if possible. And, 
uh, and also learn what was not working so well. So a lot of the early work is non-directive psychotherapy. I, mean, I think Bill Richards' flight instructions exemplify this in some way, although I, Dr. Richards' process is more complex than that. Maps moved from non-directive to interdirected work, and myth offers um, you know, this idea of turning inward, wearing eye masks, encouraging the participant to go inward and to allow the medicine to help bring up something that could then be processed later with the therapy team. Um, my friend and mentor Jeff Gus and, and others like Bennett and Vaid are, um, and I think that we should really tip a hat to the relational psychodynamic process. So much of this work is informed not really by just humanistic and transpersonal, but deeply psychodynamic and psychoanalytic traditions. It's, it, it's, it's almost so deeply a part of many psychosocial interventions as to be invisible at this point. I don't think that you have to abide by a strict neo-Freudian basis to recognize that a lot of the relational and interpersonal work in psychedelic therapy is informed by a psychodynamic approach, which was explicitly part of the approach that NYU has used. Uh, I, I didn't mean to get down on CBT. The CBT interventions that Matt Johnson and others in the smoking cessation trials have used are extremely effective. It's incredible when your dose date of taking psilocybin is also the quit date uh, for all everything that you've been building up to in your CBT prep. Uh, also, as an advisor to this trial, and our colleagues Michael Bogan shoots and using meta and motivational and in, in interviewing to roll with resistance and to deal with the issues around uh, stopping drinking, problematic drinking. Um, there's been a real ascendancy of the ACT model, and then and and from that the ACE model, the Hexaflex model, um, and uh, there's a beautiful. Yale Manual for Depression that um, Rob Krauss and Jordan Slowshower and Jeff Gruss wrote, and, and all three of these gents are on our team. Uh, obviously, the the body keeps the score and somatic practices from Bessel van der Kolk and Pete Levine and Marcella Mishka Reeds inform this work, although there are very few actually somatic based psychedelic interventions like in the clinical trial literature. Um, informally, IFS and Dick Schwartz has been very um, uh, influential, I think, in the MAPS work and has, has even built into some of the MAPS therapy work. And we see other forms of therapy, like couples therapy, conjoint therapy, Dr. Ann Wagner doing that work in Canada, uh, group work like the UCSF trials with long-term demoralization and HIV and AIDS survivors, um, the prospect of family therapy like Annie Lala's work. We've recently partnered up with Fluence and, and our friends Ingmar Gorman and Elizabeth Nielsen, who have been working in the community with people, probably like folks on this call, who are working with people who are already taking psychedelics, going to ayahuasca ceremonies, mushroom ceremonies, microdosing, et cetera, ketamine, and are, and are trying to do both harm reduction, but also support people who are in ongoing therapy in the community, even if they're not in an explicit psychedelic therapy. And they've developed what they call a trans-theoretical psychedelic support model. So all of this is informing our development of Embark. So I've built a half an hour of a rationale. I'll try to actually present the model now. Um, we, we borrowed from leading process evidence and what we've learned and looked to evidence-based practices, it, you know, the long decades of psychedelic approaches and different treatment forms. And so we pulled these different strands together and from our teachers attempted to weave something um, that we that we call Embark. Embark is a acronym, E-M-B-A-R-K, of the six clinical domains that we see that continually seem to arise across trans drug, different medicines like psilocybin, MDMT, et cetera, and also trans diagnostically for depression, anxiety, trauma, et cetera. The E stands for existential spiritual. The M is for mindfulness. The B is for the body, body aware. The A is for the effective and cognitive work that happens in this both before, during, and after. The R is about the human relationship. And K is, is really the relapse prevention. How do we turn altered states of consciousness into altered traits over time? How do we K keep momentum? So one by one, 
the existential spiritual is where we want to center and normalize what I said before was was lacking, which was mystical, religious, powerful, profound experiences, uh, including people's death encounters, um, ego death, and 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 you know, coming to terms with their own end of life, to reduce depressive symptoms. I'm focusing here on depression, uh, and inspire spiritual growth. That this is as a, a potential catalyst for for change and as a personal resource. In the mindful, the M in Embark, we explicitly bring in mindfulness practices, Vipassana practices, even just relaxation breath work to cultivate awareness of mental processes, to, to grow our capacity for self-compassion. This could be a tool, and, and we have a you know specific mechanism of action here to interrupt rumination, depressive rumination, which is very common in depression. What about the body? We want to use a trauma-informed frame, and we, we'll talk about this more later. The body is a site of trauma, but also a site of liberation and potential healing. How do we resource and ground and pendulum in and out of traumatic experience, even when we're not explicitly treating PTSD, even when we're working with people with depression or anxiety who still have lowercase t trauma, the trauma of everyday life? <clears throat> a, the, the affects, the emotions, like our cognitive thoughts about our thoughts and feelings. How do we, instead of avoiding those, how do we identify what we're thinking and feeling, welcome those feelings, and move toward or deepen those affective states, rather than shunning from them, to transform negative affect and, and, and negative self-beliefs about oneself, the world, and the future um, in depressive ideologies. The R in Embark is about the, the relational. We can, look, we know in psychedelic states that what we might think of as people's reactions or counter-transference, trans transference matrices are seem to be deeply heightened. And people are in, we're not just treating the isolated lone um, consumer in a late liquid model of capitalism. We're treating a human person who's deeply embedded in a rich network of social relationships. How do we reduce isolative social behavior through an increased sense of connectedness and moments where we might be able to repattern maladaptive relational uh, patterns with the therapist? And lastly, the work begins when the work is done. How can we build on people's motivation, usually it's very strong after a, a, a intense psychedelic work, um, to pl make plans, to set goals, uh, to catch lightning in a bottle, and to enact life changes that support sustained re symptom reduction. So these EMBARK domains, uh, they all have in our model, and you'll see we, this book that's coming out from Oxford University Press, we propose specific psychological mechanisms that a therapist can meaningfully hold, hold on to, grab on to, um, to make sense and even to, to interpret with the, the participant what might be happening for them. Um, so, for example, if I skip down to the effect of cognitive, um, one of the mechanisms is that, you know, we can transform emotions of rage or grief into something else, potentially relief, acceptance, and that affects our core beliefs, that affects our thoughts about ourselves and our world. Another potential mechanism of action in the effective cognitive domain is that we can increase our own acceptance of our own emotions. Oftentimes people just fight having them, but just accepting that we are angry at the world is actually a way to increase our capacity for suffering and to also um, to be with what is actually in front of us. Now, empirically, we haven't been able to go through all of the rigmarole of testing each of these, but we wanted to provide a, um, a, mecha a mechanistic roadmap if you're, if you're into that, if you work within that way. Okay, so you can take a breath with me because we've just moved from the six domains, but but what about what I said before, and, and Bill is really the ethical expert here. He wrote his dissertation on ethical transgressions and underground psychedelic work. Um, what about how do we center ethics broadly conceptualized in our practice? And 
in Embark, it's not just the six domains, but it's also four types of care that, that we as facilitators, as therapists strive to provide. We try to provide trauma-informed care. Secondly, we provide culturally competent care. Thirdly, we provide ethically rigorous care, which includes enhanced consent and double consent models. And lastly, we, we, we provide what we call collective care, which is um, recognizing and not pathologizing the individual, but recognizing the systemic aspects that are affect that person's suffering. This should be like a, a no duh, a basic that work should be trauma informed, even if you're not explicitly treating PTSD. And, and Ali, you and I wrote a, wrote a paper with, with Ingmar and others about post traumatic growth. I and mean, we, we can grow from our traumas, both capital T traumas and lowercase t traumas. <clears throat> But we see that the work has to be trauma informed. And even if the person you don't even know about any trauma, it can manifest in unique ways. And the clinician should be prepared to provide informed trauma informed work, including a, a skillful training about what that means before they begin working with people. Culturally competent care. I mean, I, we edited recently a book, Queering Psychedelics, where a lot of providers don't use pronouns, for example, or they misgender the person or they dead name them. Uh, there's been a lot of great work on harms against BIPOC folks in the psychedelic space. Uh, how do we correct and reflectively reflect on our own practices to focus on diverse cultural issues? Uh, to focus on our knapsacks of privilege in the room, to decenter whiteness and straightness and cisgender, uh, cis heteronormativity in our practices, and how does that affect the deep feeling of safety and cultural competence and humility that we carry into the room? The third type of care is ethically rigorous care. We reckon proactively with this legacy of transgressions, of sexual abuse, of harms, of bad outcomes. And we want to provide training to support clinicians in acting ethically, including having enough space to make hard calls. And lastly, collectively, we're all in this together. The, the medical model and the psychologists where we're, we're, we're trained to think about me being a one person and you, the participant, patient, client being one person is, I believe, outmoded in a Bronfen Brennerian or a structural criticalist model. We need to look at the economic conditions, the level of that person's community support and family support, other systemic biases in the treatment frame itself that would avoid individual pathologization and psychologization and work from and not a deficit-based model, but a strength-based model of understanding what our participants bring to the table. They come in with profound, profound strengths. We've been very lucky to be able to recruit a great team of people, teachers, supervisors, advisors, including people from many of the leading teams. Dr. Tony Back is uh, piloting has finished enrolling a, a randomized controlled trial where the piloting embarked to treat symptoms of depression and COVID affected frontline healthcare workers. These are doctors and nurses in Seattle with burnout, compassion, fatigue. Marcella Otalora at MAPS is teaching uh, on our trauma informed care work. Bill Brennan uh, is, you know, is really the architect of, of Embark. I just get to sort of hang, hang out with him. Uh, and he teaches on um, uh, keeping momentum and some of the ethical and touch um, guidelines. Manuela Mishkarid does a fantastic job talking about um, specific basic competencies uh, with the body as we get out of our cerebration and into, into the body, uh, both for the clinician and for the therapist and be, being prepared for what happens under a moderate or high dose of psychedelics. Jeff Gus uh, teaches brilliantly on relational, um, his experience working with patients relationally um, as a relational psychoanalyst in New York. Uh, Flory St. Amy is brilliant, um, I think really challenging work on what it means to actually have a safer space, not a safe space, uh, and how to do this through a liberation lens. Rob Krauss, D.D. Goldpah, Franklin King are all clinical supervisors. Um, Nicole Buchanan teaches on cultural competency. Kylia Taylor 
I was teaching on ethically rigorous care and, and our reflexive practices through using an ethic of care. Jordan Slowshower is a supervisor and Dr. Alex Kellman has taken the torch as the head of therapies in the trials that are using Embark uh, currently in multiple sites in the United States and, and going forward, I think, around the world uh, that are sponsored by Sybin. Uh, we also have guidance from people like Maurizio Fava, who's head of uh, psychiatry at uh, Harvard. Uh, Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, head of the Psychedelic Medicine Association. Tom Logren, who was for many years the uh, former director of psychiatry division at, at, the, at the FDA including uh, our friends at Fluence, Dr. Gorman and uh, Nielsen, um, chairman at uh, the chair at, at Yale's Department of Psychiatry, John Crystal, Dennis McKenna, uh, who keeps us <laughs> tied to the old guard of psychedelic work. And, and I, 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 Andrew Solomon, if you're interested, gives a brilliant, and, and Ali mentioned this, if you go to embarkapproach.com, uh, you can register there for an open access course of 15 hours of, of, of courses by these people who teach the model of Embark. And Andrew talks about his experience with depression as the author of the Noonday Demon, a National Book Award winner, um, really eloquently. Um, I'm gonna do five more minutes and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Does that work for you, uh, Ali? Um, I see a thumbs up. So this is my dorky picture uh, holding uh, shaking hands. Uh, what about the actual work itself, right? It seems like Embark is a lot. There's like six domains and there's four clinical things and there's all these different phases of prep and medicine and, and then lastly, integration session. We want you as clinicians to see it as an open architecture. You don't have to do all things to, with all people. In fact, it's kind of, we look for what is emergent and it's a patient-centered program, a patient-centered approach. So for some participants, they come in, you tell them, look, you might have all sorts of experiences with psilocybin. You might have existential spiritual experiences. You might have moments of deep mindfulness and self-compassion. You might have things happening in your body that we, we can talk about. You might have, feel very strong feelings of rage or even bliss. You might have relational experiences with people in your life or with us. Uh, and then you might want to set goals for your future. So we go through the six domains of EMBARK, but for that participant, maybe only the body is an emergent domain, or maybe only the relational domain seems to be really important in their vision. Maybe um, they have a profound mystical experience. And so in the medicine session, you attend to what's actually happening for that person. You're ready for whatever might arise. And, in the, and then in the integration sessions, the next day, the next week, later that month, you help make sense of their story and make meaning of that within that particular domain. And so you don't have to throw in the kitchen sink and go through all five of the domains if they weren't relevant. You just focus on that particular thing that arose for that particular person. I'm gonna skip through this just for the sake of time. You know, we in the book want to keep this simple. Uh, this is not highly, this is a system, but it's an open architecture. So we want, you know, I think that as a therapist, most therapists are sort of abstract random, you know, they're not necessarily deeply Kantian, like hyper systematized thinkers. So in the preparation phase, you know, we, we've providing some watchwords here, some things to keep in mind. And in preparation, we want to build trust, here, it's about empowerment. We want to be curious with the people we're working with. We want to provide a sense of spaciousness. We want to provide psychoeducation to what might happen for them, but in an unhurried way. And we want to start looking towards building skills. And so we have just watchwords. So you don't have to keep an entire chapter in mind. Um, you know, for the body, the B domain here, in preparation, there's just three watchwords. Keep in mind the wisdom of the body. Keep in mind connecting to sensation. What are we sensing? Oops. And we want to tune, let's tune in. Let's tune in to what's happening here now in the body. Same thing with the existential and spiritual. We want to invite this, the sacred into the room and say people might have profound spiritual experiences. Whatever arises, whether it's heavenly or hellacious, we approach it with non-judgment. We, we, 
curiosity and a sense of, of equipoise uh, as clinicians and, and with our participants. When you actually get to the medication session itself, we're not doing a, there is a sort of inner directed work here. We want people to do their work. We're available as clinicians. And we have, a, a, for the medicine session, a set of different watchwords. So relationally, all sorts of interesting and even messy things can happen relationally. We want to be aware of, as a therapist, as a clinician, the watchword of non-ordinary dynamics, potentially heightened relational repatterning dynamics. We want to be wise in how we respond to people and not get caught up unconsciously in, a, in an enactment. And we, we say less verbality here, but we're not ch chitter chattering, right? F less is oftentimes more here in terms of a way of relating to what's happening for somebody who's in a profound, non-ordinary state. And then in the integration phase, we have other watchwords. So really, let's even like focus on keeping momentum here. It's like, so whatever may have arisen for that person, maybe they make a new mission statement for the life. How do we marshal motivation for change? Maybe we ask them to formalize a specific action commitment and even to state it with us, or to write it down, to be very concrete even about what they might want to change. How do we move from short-term excitement or short-term, uh, I mean, even if people are bowled over by their experience, whatever is ha intensity into long-term sustainability. And, you know, for example, for mindfulness, we want to keep in the watchwords of mental freedom, a new vantage point and a new relationship with the self. And in closing, the real question is like, what is the therapeutic stance of the therapist? Bill came up with this beautiful acronym called CUSHION. And I, maybe those of you in the room have seen this. If you're in a clinical trial or a hospital or an outpatient clinic, oftentimes people are running around. They're like eating their lunch in the hallway. People are late for appointments and rushing in and getting booked in and you have to run out of the room. For... We, we want to be not this. We want to encourage people to sit on their cushion as clinicians, to be calm, to cultivate a sense of being unhurried, supportive, human, being impeccably boundaried, being open and non judgmental. And because I like antonyms, I came up with the counter let's avoid frazzle as psychedelic practitioners. Avoid frazzle frantic, rigid, artificial, zoned out, zealous, loosely boundaried, and exhausted, which I have seen all of this in myself and in other clinicians, lovingly, in regular practice and in psychedelic practice. This should be no, this should be no surprise for clinicians dealing with clinician burnout in, in, our, in our times. So that's the model, uh, and we we offer this open access course. The book is coming out. We we hope that it can. It's being adapted. It's been adapted for depression. It's also being adapted for a treatment of anxiety, a treatment of um, alcohol use disorder. We hope that it will be taken up by other researchers and clinicians for other drugs, including not just psilocybin and DMT, which is what we're applying it um, uh, analogs, which is what we're applying it to. Uh, but but also potentially other medications like ketamine. Um, and, you know, we hope to learn from people as as they use it, what works and what doesn't work. So uh, that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing and um, we have some time for questions. And I did see some Q&A and, and uh, hands going up. So thank you for the opportunity to be able to share um, this this new therapy. Uh, embark psychedelic therapy for depression, a new approach for the for the whole person. Thanks, Alex. Well, yeah, thank you, Alex. I mean, what an extraordinary effort that has gone into expanding, evolving, and conceptualizing this new method and framework. Really appreciate all the open access material that's been put out and you being with us today to describe all this for us. Um, so I'm gonna hop into a few questions. Um, you know, the first one here, I think, relates to the idea is, is this a manualized approach? Is it 
going in that direction or could you speak a little bit more about yes okay. it is a manualized approach I, I i think that it's important to under so there's a manualized approach in all of our trials we're using a th a therapy adherence model with like scoring and reviewing videos of what happens to make sure that people are are both trained on on in the embark method we used a 75 hour training and are actually doing what what should be embark in in the room um the actual um manual is coming uh, will be will be available when the book is available for pre-sale and we are also Cybin has made and with Fluence's help is making a Embark CT for clinical trials, a sort of condensed manual for the purposes of clinical trials. Uh, so we want to make all of that available. Right now, um, you can contact Dr. Bill, Bill Brennan or myself, and we can talk about sharing the manual. Or, or we wanted to make sure we get it firmed up in the book itself so that it's it's out there in the world and can be used uh, as as a manual for graduate school courses, even potentially undergraduate courses, training programs and psychedelic work for both licensed professionals and um, uh, you know, assistants or paraprofessionals doing the work. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's certainly our intention. Great, great. Yeah, because so often people ask, well, what are therapists actually doing in, in these clinical trials to get these results? So having, um, material that can be trained on and repeatable across different patients is really important. Um, okay, so onto the next question here. We have a few people asking about EMDR. Um, are you aware if there is psychedelic clinical trials going on with this method or if that works into your model at all? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, I um, I'm super curious about EMDR. I'm familiar to some extent with the practice. I haven't practiced EMDR, EMDR, um, EMDR in my own practice. Um, uh, I, I I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question. I'm not aware of any meaningful work in clinical trials using psychedelics where people are actually using EMDR. I know there's a big crossover of EMDR, EMDR clinicians and psychedelic clinicians, there seems to be culturally some fit between those two worlds. Um, I, I, I think there's some potential um, clinical theoretizing to get uh, to figure out to meaningfully combine EMDR with a psychedelic intervention because the EMDR intervention is quite intense in and of itself. So you would want to be thoughtful about how you combine that with a psychedelic med medicine session, you know, do dosing session intervention and probably not doing them at the same time or thinking about a lighter dose or something like that. So I'd be curious about that. Um, you know, we uh, are aware of EMDR, but it, uh, has uh, because it's not been used to our knowledge in above, you know, in published literature on psychedelics, it's, it was not like a core um, psychotherapy that we, we practice from, but I have a profound respect for EMDMR as an approach. Would you say it would be important for therapists to experience psychedelics before taking someone into that space? Always come back to the phrase, you can definitely, you can only take someone how deep you have gone. This is the conventional wisdom in the field. And, and I, um, you know, there's been a recent Delphi method that's about uh, that Imperial College. The Delphi method is a way of saying we don't really have RCT, randomized control trial evidence that the clinician needs to have taken the medicine in order to have good outcomes for their participants. But the consensus amongst the experts in a Delphi method is to say, okay, what do the experts say? And, and yeah, psychedelic experts, clinicians, scientists, researchers say it's important to have an experience of non-ordinary consciousness in order to facilitate an experience of non-ordinary consciousness in your client and the participant. And I've even gone so far, uh, and in our Embark training, we there's a lot to be said about this. We used holotropic breathwork. Stacia Butterfield did a beautiful training with us using Groff breathwork um, uh, to help, and where people took turns with each other. Um, it's very difficult, as anyone knows, to actually get an FDA, it's expensive to get an FDA approved trial, a legal trial in the United States to give medicine to healthy normal volunteer psychotherapist trainees so that they have the experience. And in fact, only MAPS has ever done that. And I, I believe MAPS actually had to sue the FDA to renew that trial, which is a very complicated story. I, I will say though, I'm coming out with a paper with, um, led by Dr. Torsten Passi in Germany, 
Jeff Gus and many others, where we put out what we think of as a model curriculum for training. Like what should the training be? Is this like a 12 hour course to become a psychedelic therapist? Or is it like a 20 year lifetime of tut tutelage and apprenticeship and practice? Um, and we, we argue leaning from European traditions that it, it would be ideal for a psychedelic therapist to have, at least have five sessions minimum of experience with the medicine that they are administering uh, as part of their ex what's called experiential training or self-training uh, under supervision um, in order to adequately understand what's happening and, and, and do better work. Um, that may not be feasible or legal or possible, but that would be what I would see as an ideal curriculum. Okay, great. So uh, we'll just go with the last question here, because I think you just answered the last one. Someone was asking about the need for a psychological degree. And for what, I, you're, what I'm hearing you say is that in addition to maybe some of the traditional methods of learning psychotherapy, um, psychedelic therapies would be an added training, additional competencies that someone would need to learn. Um, so we'll just finish off with Richard's question here. How important is the therapist's disclosure of psychedelic use to build rapport and trust with clients and prep sessions? Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, I'm a queer man. So coming out of the closet uh, has been part of my life that I have to do all the time. I'm constantly, even though I came out over 25 years ago, I'm still coming out to people. It's similar with psychedelic use, and it depends on that individual clinician and that individual participant about what it means to say, I have also had this experience. So now many people find that reassuring that their clinician, their doctor, their therapist has, has had an experience and has traversed this realm. Other people are less interested or even might, if, if the person did it in the underground or abroad, might even see that as um, irresponsible. So. I, I really think it's, um, while on the whole, I think people should have the opportunity to take psychedelics in order to train to give psychedelics, I think that in, it's going to matter person by person as to the meaning of that disclosure and whether or not they ask and what it means when you answer. Yeah. Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Alex, for sharing and coming to join us today. Uh, we're going to put out this video and send out an email with your resources. They're also in the chat there for everyone to access this free 15-hour course. And when your book comes out, let us know. And we're going to be happy to let everybody know that that's available. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And join us next month, October 13th, with Michael Sapiro. It's already up on the website if you want to sign up. And uh, with that, uh, have a wonderful day. And Ali, I'm just going to put one last thing in the chat, which is that if people are interested in CE or CME credits uh, and, and Embark, I put a link in the chat there. Thank you for having me, okay. Ali. This has been fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Yeah, take care. Bye.